I think it should be part of the mainstream to explore the world without assuming that we know the answer. And we should search both for primitive and intelligent life. I'd like to chat a bit about how you got into studying extraterrestrial life. I started the, in studying the universe, how the first stars formed, the, the scientific version of the story of Genesis. And then uh, I started working uh, about black holes, how black holes form and what their properties are like and how can we get an image of a black hole, a subject that uh, came to light recently. And uh, while studying the universe, the early universe, uh, I worked on a technique that allows us to image um, the scars left by the first stars on the hydrogen filling up the universe. Uh, and that's uh, based on the faint radiation emitted by hydrogen at radio wavelengths. And then at some point during lunch, uh, I realized, well, you know, one of the main limitations for uh, using this technology uh, to, to find evidence for the early hydrogen uh, is radio transmission by uh, broadcasts here on Earth, uh, interference. And I asked my colleague, uh, Matthias Zaldariaga, why wouldn't we search actually for leakage of radio waves from other planets? Uh, because it seems like the radio waves that our TV and radio broadcasting produces uh, affects our ability to observe the universe. So we might as well use the same instruments to eavesdrop on uh, emissions from other planets. And that was my first paper on SETI-related uh, topic. So that uh, led to my convergence on this subject. It seems like sort of searching for extraterrestrial life, and particularly intelligence, uh, has been sort of on the fringe, and now it's becoming, I think, significantly less fringy in recent, even in the last couple of years. Um, why do you think it's coming more into the mainstream now? Well, the search for primitive life is coming into the mainstream, and that's because of the discovery of exoplanets. Uh, that uh, age of discovery started with uh, 51 Pegasi, the planet for which the Nobel Prize was awarded. And uh, as a result, people started thinking of whether life may exist on those planets, how can we find evidence for it. But uh, they still don't dare to think about intelligent life. They go in steps and say, well, it's much more likely that it's primitive. And uh, again, it's a prejudice. And that's what I'm trying to change. I think it should be part of the mainstream to explore the world without assuming that we know the answer. And we should search both for primitive and intelligent life. Because the only place where we find both right now is on Earth, and they coexist. We should just use the best equipment we have without prejudice. In, in your own opinion, do you have a favorite way to search for life? Well, um, there are first locations to look at, uh, for life, a primitive life, for example, in the solar system, and those are well known. Uh, Mars is one place where uh, there was an atmosphere and potentially liquid water. We have evidence for that early on and um, in, in the history of Mars, and there could have been life there. Uh, and we might all be Martians if life was delivered to Earth from Mars uh, on rocks. Uh, this is a process called panspermia, the transfer of life. We could also search for life under the ice of Enceladus. We see those plumes coming from under the ice. We can search for biological molecules uh, in those plumes. Uh, the same for Europa. Uh, and um, other places in the solar system. But beyond that, we can search uh, traces of primitive life in the atmospheres of planets. That's part of the mainstream of astronomy right now, uh, going in that direction. Uh, we don't yet have powerful enough telescopes to do that. Uh, intelligent life is a completely different story because uh, potentially we can see signals to much greater distances. So the search volume is far greater. Engaging the, the likelihood of success in those searches is very difficult. So I think we should not adapt a prejudice in this search. And just like um, Columbus uh, that was aiming to get to a destiny, he ended up getting to a different place and discovered something new. Uh, the same uh, will be 
true if we explore the universe without having a prejudice. And I think the biggest mistake we can make as scientists is to assume that we know the answer in advance. And the biggest uh, enemy to discovery is uh, being conservative and prejudiced. Uh, extraordinary conservatism leads to extraordinary ignorance. And there is no better testimony to that than what happened to, to Galileo that just asked philosophers to look through his telescopes and they declined to do so. That didn't change the fact that the Earth moves around the Sun. It just led to their ignorance. And uh, I would think that by now scientists should have learned lesson from history. You had a paper about Oumuamua that went kind of wild in the media. Lots of people were interested, lots of people were angry. Um, and why do you think that paper in particular blew up so much? Because I read the paper and it was mostly sort of very normal physics-y statements about the thickness and the material strength. And then one sentence right at the end saying maybe it's aliens. Right. Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't understand that. Um, I, frankly, I'm just doing my science irrespective of the topic that I'm considering. So. In the search for intelligent life, all we are saying is that here on Earth, conditions were right to make intelligent civilizations. And on other planets, we have the same conditions. So it's not a big leap to come out and say, OK, if the conditions are the same, we might get the same outcome. And why don't we check? I don't see that as a controversial or as a, as, as a uh, speculative notion. But some of my colleagues do, and I, frankly, I don't really understand why. Uh, to me, it sounds like any other scientific hypothesis that can be tested by evidence. Do you think that part of the problem might be the difficulty of actually obtaining any evidence? No, it's not current? very difficult at all. If we had a coat umuamua in July rather than in uh, October 2017, then we would be able to see it approaching us, and then we could send a chemical rocket with a camera that would take a photograph of it. And suppose this photograph would have shown us a very weird object that looks like as if it's artificial, or if we visited the surface and we would see that it's something unusual, then everyone would be convinced, right? And so it's just science, the way science should be done. We need to collect evidence, and until we have the evidence, we shouldn't have a prejudice. Unfortunately, if we always assume what we will find, if we always say that everything we will encounter in space would be rocks, and we don't even check if it's rocks, then we are just like a caveman that looks at a cell phone and says it must be a shiny rock. Because we will never be able to discover something different than we assume. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that's the worst that we can do as scientists. Do you think people are too nervous about being wrong? If your objective is figuring out what nature is, then you might get into a situation where your colleagues do not recognize what you are saying as the right thing. And uh, you might be in a conflict, right? And, and uh, I think that uh, creating an atmosphere in which you are always supposed to follow the crowd and you should feel bad about saying anything different than what everyone else is saying is uh, damaging to the progress of science. Um, and I can give you many examples. Uh, in 1952, Otto Struve, an astronomer in the US, uh, argued that you know, if there is a planet like Jupiter close to the star, uh, like the sun, then it may tug the star back and forth at a level that we can easily detect. And he suggested looking for such things. Uh, for 40 years, time allocation committees on big telescopes refused to give time to observers to look for such systems because they argued it's a waste of time. We know that Jupiter is far from the sun where the effect is mu much smaller. And there is no reason for us to expect that a planet like Jupiter will be close to the star because we understand why Jupiter formed where it is. And so people just didn't look until Mayor and Coulos found one and were able to, to look and they got the Nobel Prize now. But even though they discovered and opened up a whole new frontier of exoplanets, uh, you know, there were 40 years wasted. And the efficiency of scientific discovery 
is reduced by having a climate in which people are afraid to speak their mind. What do you think that, that we can do to sort of foster an environment of, of creativity? I think it's very simple. Um, this culture of discovery should be based on evidence, on collecting as much data as we can. So for example, right now, the unhealthy situation in science is not only that you have a prejudice about issues like whether there is life out there, but at the same time, physici theoretical physicists are speculating at a level that is far greater on other topics that will never be tested, such as the multiverse that we have no way of accessing, or, and that's considered part of the mainstream, or extra dimensions. Uh, and I think uh, that's a distortion of the balance uh, in a way that uh, science should put most emphasis on uh, questions where we can make progress by collecting data. And of course we can speculate about other things, but those should be given less priority in the mainstream. So we should just follow where the data allows us to make progress because it's a dialogue with nature. It's not a monologue. And so I think a healthy environment is one that promotes the importance of evidence over prejudice and at the same time allows people to take risks. So for example, funding agencies provide funds to individuals not based on what they tell them they will discover because very often you can't forecast what you will discover. So you give funds to individuals because you trust their ability to discover. By that you allow some parts of the community to go in directions that are unexplored, unknown and, and make discoveries that were unexpected. And searching for life is one of those. And having zero funds given by federal agencies uh, to the search for intelligent life makes no sense in my view. So, by the way, everything that I say, in my view, is down to earth and should be common sense. I don't see why it should be regarded as out of the mainstream. Thank you so much for taking the time for to sure. talk. It's been really fascinating. I appreciate it.